Hello, I'm Charles Bell, Senior Vice President of Camira. We're proud to be a part of the presentation of the history of the Irish people in Savannah and the 1993 St. Patrick's Day celebration. We hope you'll enjoy this keepsake memento of the Irish in Savannah. The quality of Camira's product depends upon the skill of its people. Their future depends on Camira's ability to plan for tomorrow. That's why Camira's committed to reaching out to the community, improving for its own good and the good of others. Camira is Savannah, serving the world. For a lot of people, the story of Irish Savannah is the burning green grits that almost set the golf club on fire. But it didn't start there. For others, the story is of a grand parade marching proudly through downtown Savannah on a spring morning. But it didn't start there either. Football fans remember Irish Savannah for the great games BC and Savannah High played on Thanksgiving Day in Grayson Stadium but it didn't start there. Images of St. Vincent's with its discipline and tradition are a key part of many of Savannah girls' most vivid memories, but it didn't even start there. And it certainly didn't start with a party on River Street with its hooping and hollering that goes morning, noon, and night for days at a time. It started in Ireland with a man named Patrick in the fifth century with shamrock in hand, spread Christianity from one end of the island to the other. The parish priest who came after Patrick inherited the love of the Irish. Fathers and monks built schools and hospitals, wrote hymns and poetry. But across the sea from the Emerald Isle sat its uneasy neighbor, England. Through the centuries, disputes had arisen frequently between the two countries over faith, land, and government. Finally, after years of civil and religious unrest, the last straw broke the camel's back. The famine of the late 1840s took three million people from the Irish population. Most died of starvation and disease, but some found their way to America and ultimately Savannah, Georgia. They came over, uh, my um, grandpa Rossita and my grandmother was a Corrigan, and she had no nationality. She was born on a ship coming over. My grandfather, Rossiter, came over when he was 15 years old. Didn't know a soul. They were unskilled, were these early Irish, and thus ill-equipped for life in America. They had stepped on the ladder at the bottom rung, a foot in their face from the guy on the step above them. Some of the buildings down there that the freed slaves had moved out of and called those buildings uninhabitable. And yet the Irish immigrants moved into them. The 1860 census, my uh, great-grandfather was listed as a blacksmith. And his wife, uh, could, she was over 21, could neither read nor write. And his total assets, personal, private property, I mean, was listed as $25. They took any jobs they could get. They had the hardest of jobs. They built canals all over the country and railroads. They took on jobs because they had to in order to live. That the plantation owners would not allow their Negro slaves to do. They considered their Negro slaves too valuable to engage and those hazardous jobs. This is the old fort section of Savannah. It was so named for the military installation that was built here in 1759. They called it Fort Savannah, but later they renamed it to honor a Revolutionary War hero, Mad Anthony Wayne. But as the Irish population swelled in the 1840s and 50s, the area would take on another name as the Irish began to call it home. And I can remember as a child, we'd go back down there to visit friends or family who were still down there. My mother was constantly, or my grandmother, one would be constantly pointing out, we live there, we live there, we live there. And my daddy jokingly said, yeah, y'all moved every time the rent came due. 
The old Ford had a, a fighting gang, and the west side, Yamacraw, had another fighting gang. So they would, you know, they would refer to each other as the, um, that particular gang. I don't think that uh, we went out and looked for trouble, but if it was there, we never backed off of it too far. An ancient Irish legend tells of the good King Lear of Ballet Castle, who was father to three gentle boys and a daughter called Finola. On the death of the children's mother, King Lear remarried to a woman as wicked as his first wife had been kind. In jealousy and hatred, the new queen changed the children into swans, there to remain until the coming of Christian bells to Ireland. For 900 years, the swans sailed on the waters, with Panola always sheltering her brothers. By day, they spoke with the men of Erin, and by night, they chanted fairy music with such sweetness that any who listened forgot all pain and grief. The years turned to decades, and the decades to centuries on the quiet pond, until at last, a saint arrived in Ireland and rang the bells that broke the spell on the swans, who were baptized and spirited away to heaven to spend eternity. Here, Yamacraw and Frogtown were the Irish sections of the city where the immigrants flowed in unprecedented numbers. The 1860 census showed over 3,000 in the city to have been born in Ireland, almost one-fourth of Savannah's total population of 13,000. But they were not the first Irish in Savannah. Indeed, in 1734, Oglethorpe had rescued 40 Irish slaves who had washed ashore in the new colony. And later, one of the heroes of the American Revolution, Sergeant William Jasper, had been Irish. More than a half century later, Savannah's Irish Jasper Greens would take their name from this legendary soldier. Oglethorpe, though, had been loyal to the British Crown's policies toward Irish Catholics and had barred them from the colony. That restriction eased as time wore on and a sprinkling of Catholics became more visible as the 18th century progressed. In 1796, the parish of St. John the Baptist was begun in Savannah. 16 years later, in 1813, the records show in Savannah that the Hibernian Society held the first official commemoration of St. Patrick's Day. But that initial private celebration ended not at a Catholic church, but at Independent Presbyterian. Many believe that Savannah's Scottish Protestants had staged the ceremony to show support for their Irish Catholic neighbors. <laughs> Starting in 1824, Catholics do, in fact, claim the public celebration for their own. But it'll be 20 years before Ireland's potato famine drives thousands of more Irish to Savannah's shores. The sons of Aaron had literally jumped from the frying pan into the fire, because just at that instant, the colonial South and the industrial North were squaring off to settle a host of differences that divided them. You had the Irish Jasper Greens. They went at first. But then you had another group. There were so many Irish here at that time that all of them couldn't go off with the, the Greens. So they formed a second unit known as the Montgomery Guards. In August of 1861, they were willing to go off and fight for the South, but they wanted to go as their own unit. 
Uh, the Irish were some of the most uh, staunch uh, secessionists. That was even during the uh, brewing times of the 1840s and the 1850s, before the Civil War. And I think the Irish were just very loyal to wherever they happened to be geographically and uh, take up the flag for their sort of home sod, whether it be New York, Savannah, or, uh, or Mother Ireland. Of all the heroic stories that have been passed to the children of the war between the states, none is more compelling than that of Savannah's father, Peter Whalen. In the early 1850s, Father Whalen was assigned to Savannah and volunteered to be chaplain of Savannah's Irish Montgomery Guard at Fort Pulaski. When Pulaski fell to the Union's rifled cannon, Father Whalen volunteered to join the rest of the garrison in a Yankee prison. There, Colonel Olmstead, commander of the Confederates, took note of Father Whalen's compassion in his diary. He was a man somewhat past middle age, uh, large in frame and simple in manner, and it must be said, untidy in dress. It was his custom to take a walk around the ramparts every morning, a little before sunrise. And I was generally there at the same time, so we saw a good deal of each other and became quite friendly. After we had been prisoners for some time, Father Peter's one suit of clothes became so decidedly shabby that it hurt us all to see him so appareled. Well, accordingly, his measurements were secretly taken and an elegant new suit made for him. That night as he slept, the old clothes were taken and the new ones put in their place. The old man was perfectly delighted with them, showing a little harmless vanity in, in their possession, and that was really touching. But later in the day, I met him with his old suit on once more. He explained that he had met a new prison arrival who had been captured while swimming a river with only his underclothing on. The poor fellow was in a wretched condition, and to him, Father Whalen had given the new suit. I asked him why he had not given him the old clothing. His reply was, when I give for Christ's sake, I give the best. Father Peter's stock rose even higher when he was in a prisoner exchange and was returned to the state of Georgia. In early 1864, he was once again ministering to the troops, but this time it was to the hordes of dying Northern boys in a nightmare Confederate camp of Andersonville, Georgia. They said of him that he aged a year for each day at Andersonville. Father Peter survived the end of the war by only five years. His funeral procession was marked by 86 carriages and buggies, while hundreds of mourners lined the route. In the Savannah Morning News, nine gentle words served as epitaph. May the green sod lie lightly on his breast. All along the route, there's constant dialogue back and forth between the parade and the crowd as old friends spot each other in the annual renewal of the bonds of friendship. As the parade rounds the squares, it becomes clear this is still an intensely private, public celebration. On Bay Street, the flavor of the parade changes. Here, in close quarters with River Street, are the tourists and the partiers less concerned with St. Pat's grand traditions and more concerned with the pleasures of the here and now. Beer! Beer! <laughs> we learned something in our trek with the parade this Saturday. We learned there are actually two parades in Savannah on March 17th. One for the raucous crowd that gathers near the clubs and thinks of the celebration as a non-stop party. And another for the people who've stood in the same spot and waved at the same friends for generations listening as band after band strikes up its fanfare for the common man. The women really had it so hard over here because um, they couldn't speak the English to believe it or not. They, you know, they spoke with such Irish brogue until they weren't understood. They didn't come into a society that welcomed them because especially in Savannah they came into an English colony, not an Irish colony, and, uh, which made it very difficult for the women. And I think because of that, this, they bonded together down in Old Fort and Yamacraw, and they bonded together, this bond that has been in Savannah for all these years. And that's the reason why the Irish here are so close, because they had to be. Strong Irish women. And in Savannah, there is no image more vivid than the set jaw of a daughter of Aaron. And much of that legacy started right here at St. Vincent's even before the Civil War.
They came to respond to a need. Uh, Father O'Neill had orphans that needed to be housed and taken care of. He wanted to open uh, schools and he also, I'm sure, had in mind that uh, ultimately hospitals would, would be uh, staffed by the Sisters of Mercy. St. Vincent's, its whole history is steeped in, in uh, the, uh, in, in a sense, in its uh, roots in Ireland. Practically 99% of the names of the early religious who entered here at St. Vincent's all have Irish names. Confederate President Jefferson Davis sent his daughter to St. Vincent's, but her celebrity has recently been overshadowed by the fame of a world-class writer who roamed these halls as a little girl, Mary Flannery O'Connor. Well, I think her Catholic upbringing definitely did. I mean, that sort of, you know, it, it's all woven into her story. She, you know, in Savannah, I'm not sure that she's appreciated as much as she is worldwide. We've gone to the, um, the Flannery O'Connor room in the library at the Georgia College in Milledgeville, and they have people coming from Japan and all over the world to study her writing. Some 60 years after St. Vincent's was born, the men finally got on track with the founding of Benedictine in 1902. Here at BC converged three crucial elements in defining the character of Savannah's Irish community, religion, heritage, and education. I think that all the families in Savannah who sent their sons here recognized that the Benedictine monks who preceded me, uh, men whose names are now legend, uh, you know, Father Stanislaus, Father Aloysius, um, those men, they were dedicated to teaching and they were dedicated to teaching values as well as their subject matter. Uh, you look back through the alumni records, you'll see that McNamara's, the O'Brien's, the Reardon's, the Ray's. You can just go through the laundry list of alumni and you can see that the Irish people, that's where the boys went. It is rigorous, very regimented. Uh, and I think that's part of that commonality because each of us come here as an individual, but we walk away as a Benedictine man. Uh, we, we put away those childly things and we learn the bonding of what we're supposed to be doing here. Self-discipline, integrity, honor. Uh, and I think by going through that initiation process, if you would, that's one of the things that cements us together as being Benedictine people. Somehow, those quiet little Irish guys found a way to stir up a king-sized rivalry with the fellows up the street at Savannah High. Out of that spirit grew the pump, ceremony, and legend of the Thanksgiving Day BC Savannah High football game. Thanksgiving Day playing Savannah High School had to be the, the second biggest thing in my life. And uh, I have some fond memories of the old stadium out there, and it goes way back. Uh, since 1950, actually, when I became the head coach, and I was the head coach there for 19 years. It was not just a football game, it was a social event. It was always played in the afternoon, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on um, Thanksgiving afternoon. And the ladies would have on their finest uh, attire, and, and, and the men wore suits. Uh, nobody went dressed in a pair of jeans and a, and a sports cap. You know, it was a social event. And, Everybody wore the, the mum cassages and so forth and with the maroon ribbons or the blue ribbons and depending on the school. And, and it, they would fill Grayson Stadium to capacity. I mean, literally, it would be packed. And they even sat up in the later, later years, they set up uh, chairs along the sideline to, to, to handle the overflow crowd. And the bands were going great guns and you know, both, you know, the stands would erupt when something would happen. I mean, it was, the noise level was fantastic. It was not a, an uncommon to cheer or holler, somebody to holler from the stands, come on Irish, let's go. Because if you look down the roster of the, name, of the names, the Buttermers and the Rossiters and all that played, uh, there were a great many of the names were Irish.
being Irish in Savannah is, um, is a way of life. So we all stick together and everyone knows one another and no matter which society you may belong to, you know everyone else in the other society. It was just lovely. We had our little community, we had our parochial schools, we had our freedom, it was beautiful. People when they came over here, they had a hard time, you know, and the, uh, you go back on the history of it, you see where they had to stick together, and I think that togetherness has, has stuck with everybody. Plus the traditions passed on every year, and uh, I think it gets a little bit stronger every year. It used to just be a big party, now people are more roots oriented. I came in the, in the, in the 30s, 1934. I was amazed at the heat and the humidity of Savannah. I was fascinated by all the trees I saw, by the buildings, and by the people, especially the Negro people, walking the streets and selling their vegetables, and their loud plaintive cries, and the women stately walking with baskets of clothes and baskets of fish upon their heads. And then I was amazed, turning and seeing the beautiful French Gothic Cathedral. I didn't expect to see anything like that in, in the city. And, uh, and I, when I found a strong Catholic spirit amongst the descendants of the Irish who were here, this really fascinated me. Things get better for Savannah's Irish in the late 1800s and 1900s. They become policemen and firemen. They stick together and bring their friends into the fold. That's how so many Irish ended up in the same occupation the same way so many Irish ended up in Savannah. The principle was that once you were established, you should help somebody else come aboard. But a lot of the time, the challenge was to get your foot in the door in the first place. There would be signs on buildings saying, help wanted Irish need not apply. So they had a very difficult time getting employment. And where today we all name our children Patrick and Sean and uh, such as that and, and a real and flaunt our Irish uh, openly all the time. They tried to lose the brogue and lose the name so that they could get a job and not be associated with being Irish. In spite of all of the tough times they went through together, you won't get much belly aching out of the Irishman. In fact, they joke about everything. They joke about drinking, they joke about church, and they really joke about each other. In 1977, a reporter here at WTOC intended to get Toby Buttermer and John Fogarty together on a park bench to talk about old times. But what he got was two old Irishmen trying to outdig each other. Listen carefully. Well, you know, in the years past, the parade used to stop there for about five minutes. So all these old guys like Fogarty and them could run in the fire station. Just to take a drink, really. Uh -huh. so they, were, they were very polite in those days. They went to the fire station and took a drink. My grandfather brought over his grandfather. <laughs> he came over on a schooner. Never paid the fare when he got to where he stood. <laughs> but used to rent a few mules for my granddaddy. And every Sunday, yeah. every Sunday, Mr. Buttermer with, with a fellow named Madden, and I think uh, Desmond O'Driscoll's father used to come once in a while. They'd come and get their belly full of Duffy's Pure Malt Whiskey. Then when they were leaving... Not at the Fogarty house. Oh, no, yes. They had it in, in, the, in, the, in the feed house. It might have been Murphy's or Gary's. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the happening was that all three, after getting something for nothing, they were great people for that, they'd, they'd say to my granddaddy, of course, I was there trying to You're get it. You're charging a, too much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I was trying to get a quarter tip from him. You know what I mean. Yeah, a quarter, quarter tip. tip. But anyhow, tell it, about the time you won the pony, the horse. Oh, yeah. And it ran away down Montgomery Street. That's true. That's true. Yeah, but like they didn't want it. No. You stole the pony. <laughs> <laughs> By the middle of the century, the Irish had come to power, political power, here in the city of Savannah. 
the Bowen machine ran things much like, as we are told, Mayor Daley did in Chicago. He was the kingpin for a while. He, ma he made the... And you had on the county Jim Houlihan, an Irish Catholic too. The county for a good while, Bowen and the city, Houlihan and the county. They were both, as far as I know, honorable gentlemen. There were people of their time. Well, the Irish began really early on to realize you needed to get organized and you need to get into politics. And uh, so that, they are the perfect masters, like say the Kennedy family, uh, you know, by the uh, 19th century of understanding how the system works and, uh, and making it work to their advantage, all playing by the rules. Certain jobs were sacred to the crackers. Crackers meant native Georgian. It could even mean in a ge general sense Protestant Georgian. To the Jews, they had their own group. They had their jobs too. And then the Irish. The Irish meant Catholic. In those days, you could come from Naples or Berlin or London town. But if you lived in Savannah and you were a Catholic, you were called an Irishman. How did we get this deep into a show about the Irish without saying more about St. Patrick's Day? Well, we figured you've heard a lot about Savannah's world-famous celebration already, but there are a few stories we'd like to share. Like the time President Jimmy Carter came to Savannah for the Hibernian Banquet and snuck over to Pinky Master's Saloon where he stood on the bar and memorialized his good friend or the St. Patrick's parades before 1941 that always started with a mass in St. Patrick's Church on West Broad Street, converted in 1882 from a cotton warehouse where mass had formerly been said, or the countless stories of Irish shenanigans and unbelievable luck. Michael McDonough, God rest his soul, he and I were working on the adjutant staff in, in, in Forsyth Park. And I, had, I remember I had on a brand new pair of shoes and the water was literally running out of the shoes. I was walking in such deep water and we were being just drowned. And uh, he said, uh, I'll be back in a minute. And he left and he came back. I said, where did you go? And uh, he told me he had gone to call his sister who was in the convent. And she, he said, uh, they're gonna see what they can do about this rain. And about 10, 15, it quit raining and we stepped off and walked the parades. St. Patrick's Day is celebrated differently in Ireland. Primarily there, it's a religious holiday. We have that same thing here. We honor him for that. But then in addition to that, we honor the, the immigrants who came over with nothing, absolutely nothing. And then what they did with them with their lives, enabling us to have what we have today. You could depend on everybody to be just as perfect as they could during the parade. They were proud of it. Uh, we would get into the old Ford area down off of East Broad and Broughton and so forth around there. Band, and we had a band back then, believe it or not. The band would play the Benedictine Fight song. And if you didn't get chill bumps walking in that, you shouldn't have been there anyhow because you didn't understand what it was all about. They rallied to the cause of American freedom. They were particularly anxious to prove they were thoroughly Americans. We dreamed in Ireland of a land beyond the sea, where rich and poor stood equal in the light of freedom's day. That's part of the song of the weary of the green. So we looked to America as a land of freedom. We were particularly anxious to be associated with the American Republic and the fight for freedom. <laughs> 